The Last Word with Matt Cooper. Today FM. It all happens here. Now, there are some people who would try and have it that this is some sort of failed state, which isn't true if you look at the facts objectively, if you look at us by comparison with our past, if you look at Ireland by comparison with other countries. Yes, there are many things that we could and should do differently and better, as we discuss regularly on this programme. But I'm very taken by a book by Mark Henry, the psychologist, called In fact, an optimist guide to Ireland at 100. Because, thank you Mark for joining us, it is great to see actually it enumerated the many changes that have taken place in this country over the last century and how, for most people, our standard of living and life is better, isn't it? Matt, I think you've perfectly hit the nail right on the head there. I mean, we're approaching our 100th anniversary next year, right? I mean, it's a big birthday. It's a chance to look back and see what we've achieved in the past century. And that's what I've done in In Fact. And the reality is, as you say, there are immeasurable improvements across every aspect of life, from the economic, the social, the political. I've pulled together 100 remarkable achievements that, you know, as you say, you know, the United Nations now ranks Ireland as the country with the second highest quality of life in the world. You know, we live 25 years longer than those uh, people who were alive 100 years ago. Half of working age adults now have completed third level education. Obviously, lives of women, of children have improved immeasurably. So I talk about all of that. The evidence is there, but also, of course, some of the psychological biases, because that doesn't come easy to us. We, it doesn't sit easily with us because, in fact, our brains aren't that well attuned to assess uh, progress over the long term. We live longer, but also you go through how we live healthier. And again, despite all of the legitimate criticisms we have about hospital waiting lists and amount of time it might take to get through an emergency department, we do live longer, healthier lives. Absolutely. I mean, I have in the book the top 20 uh, disease killers of, uh, of 1922. Most of them are gone completely. Tuberculosis, number one, bronchitis, number three, uh, measles, diphtheria. Sure, appendicitis was the top 20 killer back, uh, back in 1922. We've eliminated all of that. Even as recently as the 1970s, we're only spending about 300 euros per man, woman and child in the country on health care. Now it's more than three and a half thousand per person. Uh, our, our lifespans have expanded, as I say, by, by 25 years. We're taller. We're taller by uh, 11 centimetres for women. They're the same height as men were 100 years ago. Uh, men have actually grown by, by 12 and a half centimetres. And all that is due to nutrition. It's due to the medicines. We are living healthier. We are the healthiest generation actually ever to live on this island. I wonder how many people are going to be listening to this and hating hearing all of these good things. You also look at how we're eating better and that is a very significant thing as well. We're eating healthier. We also have a greater variety of food that we enjoy. Exactly. I mean, again, we've doubled the amount of fruit and veg we've eaten over the last, uh, the last. Oh, let me see, I think it's about 60 years or so. Uh, and yet food is cheaper. We spend far less on food than we, than we ever did before. Now, sure, there's a challenge we could argue we're eating uh, a bit too much of it, maybe in some instances. And sure, we have to balance that because there are, of course, challenges uh, that face us in the years ahead. But all in all, again, we've never been healthier. We've never lived longer. And uh, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's something to celebrate. And that is what I'm trying to do. And in fact, I'm skipping. Coming through the sort of the, the subjects that you cover here and in fact and you go through them in great detail explaining each particular point, 100 points that you make. But I am also taken by what you say about living easier in a sense as well that even the homes that we live in. Now, I know there's a generation with very good reason who have reasons to worry about whether they're ever going to be able to afford to buy their own home or are struggling with rent. But again, if you look at previous generations and if you look at what happens in other countries we have bigger, more comfortable homes to live in. <laughs> you know, this is one of the, the dramatic changes. I mean, again, if you think to your history textbooks back, you know, in the 1920s, what were they? I mean, the, the tenement children of Dublin, I mean, the tenements were being compared to uh, those of Calcutta at the time, believe it or not. You saw those pictures of, of, of children in, in rags and with no shoes on. I mean, that, that was Ireland 100 years ago. Most people, most families lived in rooms of only two or three and that had no uh, no toilet in there at all. And on average, there was four or five of them in each household. We flipped that completely. Now the average in each household is two or three people and we've got five or more rooms is the average house. So we have absolutely transformed. And again, if you think about all the, all the appliances that weren't there uh, all those years ago, that has transformed so many people's lives, of course, women in particular. I talk about this, this big crossover that happened in the 1990s. In other words, go back to the 1970s, more than 7 in 10 of women were still engaged primarily in home duties. You had only a quarter in the workplace. 
And that gradually began to decline then. The 80s accelerated through the Celtic Tiger, the crossover point 1996 when it was 50-50. Now it's the opposite. Seven in ten nearly in the workplace, uh, less than two in ten full-time in home duties. A lot of that comes from education as well, which you focus on, which is one of the major developments for this country. It is, you know, I mean, we've gone from uh, from having, uh, well, I would tell you when I left school about it, we're not too different in, in vintage. You know, the year that I left, there was only one in 10 of us went to university. I look at the tables that come out every what year. Sorry, now, what the, year was that? Oh, 1988. Okay, it's look- five years later than I left school, but anyway. <laughs> well, I don't think it was that different. Uh, you know, the problem is, of course, or the transformation is what's happened since. You look at the league tables for the same school now, it's seven in ten, eight in ten kids are going on to university. So we've literally doubled the number of adults in the population who have third level education. We are the second highest in all of Europe. The majority of women who outperform men in this area uh, now have a, a third level qualification. And yet that has absolutely been one of the one of the four things that I identify that absolutely contributed to our transformation as a nation. And that then feeds into our jobs and employment. And the country has never had more people at work, has it? Exactly. Now, pre-COVID, of course, of course, but, you know, absolutely. For the first kind of 50 years of the country's history, there was only a million people working. That was it. It didn't grow. It didn't grow in any way. And then in the 70s, as we opened up through joining the EEC, of course, the European Union at the time. Uh, and then, of course, we attracted foreign direct investment. So it began to grow 2.3 million uh, before uh, COVID hit. And now four, more than 40 percent of those jobs are high skilled. Again, you go back 20 years, that was only a quarter. So again, we've seen this huge transformation tied to education. And it also means that people are paid better and also don't have to work as long hours as they might have had to do in the past. Do you know, I, I know a lot of people won't think this is true, but actually we work 20% fewer hours than, uh, than we did 20 years ago. Uh, yeah, I mightn't feel like it, but it, it's true because in fact the average uh, working week uh, back in the 90s was 48 hours. But then in came EU legislation that said 48 hours was the maximum working week. So people had to reduce their hours along with more part-time working these days. So in fact, we have more leisure time than ever. To your point, we've actually got more income than ever. We have more leisure time and more th- things we can do with it. You also focus how we are more open to the world in all sorts of ways, in exporting goods and services, in actually travelling to other parts of the world for holidays rather than emigrating to them. Exactly. I mean, one of our clear successes, of course, if you look back over our, our hundred years, was ending the, the travesty, if you like, of emigration. I mean, you know, so much of generations were lost, particularly the 1950s, nearly half of those people in their 20s had to emigrate. It's completely the opposite. Now we are one of the most multicultural countries in Europe because nearly one in five people who live here now in Ireland weren't born here. They came here for opportunities and that's fantastic. As you say, in 1992, one in five Irish people was travelling for an international holiday. One in five. Within 15 years, there were as many holidays being taken overseas as there are Irish people. Now it's more. So some people are taking two or three, of course. Not everyone's getting a holiday. But on average, we are now the most travelled nation in all of Europe. We spend more nights overseas on holidays than any other country in, in Europe. And you also focus on our achievements in culture and sports, exporting, achieving, winning internationally. Yeah, yeah, I mean, look, one I like is uh, is the Oscars. Now, it depends how you look at it, but in theory, if you look at uh, if you look at it on a per capita basis, we have more Oscar winners in this country than they do in the states, than they do actually in anywhere else. Now, I'm claiming Daniel Day Lewis as our own, but hey, <laughs> he's got the Irish passport. There's also been a lot of changes in society, and a lot of them have come in the last 25 years or so, in particular. Uh, first of all, decriminalisation of homosexuality, then marriage equality, uh, other issues that have made Ireland, I think, one of the most progressive, even if there are some who don't necessarily think that's all a good thing, it certainly is remarkable by comparison with our past. Exactly. I, exactly. I think that op, you know, openness, I talked about education, it's another one of those factors that helped transform Irish society. We are, have been open in putting Irish people out onto the world stage. I talked about the acting stage there, literally. Uh, but also, as I say, open as a society and bringing people in. Sure, initially foreign direct investment, now talent from around the world. And, and that has been positive for all of us. It has helped drive Irish society to the point, as I say, where the UN says we have the second best quality of life in the world today. That's because of the how long we're living. That's because of our high education levels. That's because of our high income levels. It's not perfect, but we've come a long, long way in 100 years. Indeed, and you focus on better lives for women, better lives for children. You focus on us becoming increasingly environmentally conscious and also helping the world. But you're not blind to failings either, are you? 
Well, exactly. I have a chapter there at the end where as we, where as, as we look forward to our next hundred years, uh, what are the big challenges we face? And like we, we talked here about education, right? So the, the funding that's going in now uh, to, sec- to third level education is half the level it was per student before the Great Recession. Now, that's not good when that's one of the key factors that has driven our economic success. Likewise, of course, the housing uh, crisis, it threatens our, our social cohesiveness, our sense of community, which has been very positive. You know, we, income inequality in Ireland has reduced. It was at the lowest level on record just before uh, COVID back in 2019. So we have made great strides, but we've got to be careful. We've got to understand the challenges that face us and address them as our predecessors have successfully if we're to continue to be top of that league table. This is a tremendous corrective to excessive negativity. Mark Henry is the author of In Fact, An Optimist Guide to Ireland at 100. It's a real eye-opener. I think many people, particularly some of the social media keyboard warriors, would do well to have a read of it. Mark Henry, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Matt. The Last Word with Matt Cooper. Weekdays from 4.30. Today, F-